Hello kind people, this is Peter Swidler for Chess24, recording a highlight video for run 9 of the Wine Kanzai Tournament 2020. Barely losing my voice here for no reason whatsoever, I apologize for uh, potential issues with that. And there was only uh, ever going to be one choice of game of the day today. Uh, Alireza Firuja played his first ever classical game against Magnus Carlsen, and uh, we were always going to be uh, talking about that game, so let's actually do that. And uh, here you see the graphic. Uh, they famously played <clears throat> a much contested uh, game in the Moscow <clears throat> World uh, uh, Blitz Championship, uh, a game that has already uh, sunk a thousand ships, so to speak, and uh, also played a decent amount of online Blitz, but it is their first over-the-board classical encounter. Alireza opens with uh, 1e4, e5, already a mild surprise because Magnus uh, uh, quite noticeably has been a uh, Sicilian player in the past uh, year and a bit. Knight of three, knight c6, bishop b5, and knight of six. And uh, Magnus hasn't really been playing the, the Berlin recently at all, and uh, somewhat here humorously during the live show, uh, it, it had been pointed out to, to us that the previous time he's done this was actually a game I probably was supposed to remember because it was against me in the bill uh, round robin in 2018, a game I uh, eventually drew after not <clears throat> not exactly equalizing uh, with the white pieces. d3, and here instead of bishop c5, which is something he played against me, for instance, Magnus played d6, uh, very clearly saying that I would like to play a game of chess with as uh, as little topical theory uh, you young men uh, are probably aware of, uh, keep as many pieces on the board as possible, and just play chess. c3, there's definitely an argument uh, to be made for playing castles here, in particular if black plays g6, which is a structure that Magnus has been aiming for uh, quite a bit. There is the option of playing d3, d4, but considering what Magnus uh, chose to do after c3, I'm pretty sure that even after uh, the white castling, he could still play bishop b7 uh, with uh, a very, very high likelihood <clears throat> that some kind of a position, very much like the one they got in the game, would have appeared uh, on the game. Uh, on the board by move 10. c3, Magnus includes a6. Now that you played uh, c2, c3, uh, these positions, uh, they are, uh, it's very important for white in the structure to develop the knight to c3 before playing g3, g4. So bishop takes a6 no, no longer really an option. Bishop a4, bishop e7, castles, castles. And here uh, is an exciting opportunity for me to plug my own series a little bit because this now is the central position of the uh, 6d3 variation when black doesn't play b5. And I cover this in, uh, in very, very uh, serious detail for, uh, for my video series. I've done, I've done a lot of work trying to figure out what white is supposed to do here. And Jan paid me a, a rare compliment during one of the live shows during this year's coverage of Wank and Zaya, saying that uh, when they were preparing for the Karakian match in New York, they actually looked uh, through uh, my stuff and uh, found it to be uh, useful. It obviously has been expanded upon, but they did not found it. They did not find it to be uh, to be all that bad uh, uh, quality. So uh, I don't think you can get much more of a uh, quality check mark uh, than that. And in this position, I also played rookie one, which already you can make an argument is a deviation <clears throat> from the sharpest attempt white has at an advantage here, which sounds strange. Rook one is such a typical move in these Spanishes. But probably the sharpest way to play for advantage here for white is knight bd2, rook e8, and the immediate d4 here, even without the inclusion of rook e1. And um, I do give a, a, a whole speech here in the series about b5, bishop c2, and now black's sharpest reply is takes, takes, bishop h4, uh, which could lead to uh, incredibly unbalanced positions where black actually sacrifices a piece by move 14, which I think is something that Magnus uh, wouldn't have been unhappy about. This is a very sharp position, which uh, if he chose to go for it, he would know. And Alireza, who uh, is not, I think, as, uh, such a habitual 6d3 player, probably wouldn't be that aware of. But Rookie 1, clearly not a, not a mistake. It's just... Uh, Already a slightly uh, nondescript uh, decision. Rook e8, bishop 92, bishop f8. And here, once again, there is a, a fork in the road for white. 
the Mufali Reza chose H3, uh, basically transposed to a different Spanish altogether. Uh, and I will explain why in a moment. And white has two different options here apart from h3. You can go knight f1, black finally plays h6, and after knight g3, black goes b5. Uh, bishop b3, knight a5 with the intention of playing c5. The next move is one very well known position. And bishop c2, uh, d6, d5 instantly is uh, another. This is what I recommend in the videos, and this is also what I had on the black side in, in a game against Hikaru Nakamura, and I was uh, doing quite well in that game. And once again, there is a very sharp option here of playing instantly d3, d4, uh, b5, bishop c2, once again hoping to save on the tempo uh, that white normally wastes on playing h3. And here, once again, there is this option of playing e, d, c, d, bishop g4, h3, bishop h5. And after g4, black once again has the option of this peace sacrifice, or he can play bishop g6, as was, for instance, played in a game between Alexander Grishuk and uh, Shahriyam Midyarov in a in the London Grand Prix in 2012. Alireza plays h3, though, uh, b5. Now, once again, bishop b3, knight a5, bishop c2, c5 is something black would be extremely happy about because uh, he gets uh, this pawn center, which is something black generally wants in these types of positions. And he didn't even play bishop b7, because the bishop is not often required on b7, sometimes you develop it to e6. So this is quite decent. You have to play bishop c2, uh, bishop b7, and you sort of have to play d3, d4 now, because uh, not, not, not much else really makes uh, any sense. You can, you can go slow with something like knight f1, knight g3, uh, uh, but you are, are not going to be threatening the black position very much if you do that. And uh, after d4, we are actually uh, very much in uh, Zaitsev land. This is no longer any kind of 6d3. This is straight up uh, uh, a somewhat rare line of the Zaitsev variation, and I will now have to bore you a little bit with details about uh, uh, the Zaitsev theory. The Zaitsev variation of uh, the Spanish uh, uh, arises after a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, d6, uh, white makes the normal moves, black goes rook e8, d4, bishop b7, knight bd2, uh, bishop f8. And here there is uh, a lot of theory connected with all kinds of ideas, d4, d5 is a very serious move, uh, a4 has a lot of theory connected to it, and this is actually something that Alireza uh, used in the first round to beat uh, Vladislav Kovalev in this tournament. But there is also uh, the move bishop c2 here, which is the exact transposition <coughs> to the uh, game we're now discussing, and also there is this move a3. And after a3, <coughs> black has two main choices. Black can play g6 after which white generally goes bishop a2 and uh, bishop g7, b4. And this position has been discussed uh, quite uh, quite seriously recently. There has been a number of uh, reasonably high-level games. Uh, Mamidarov played this with the black pieces in uh, 2019. I had a game against Karyakin starting from this position. Uh, it's a sharp position, but I have a feeling uh, black doesn't entirely equalize. I definitely didn't equalize against Karyakin, although I didn't, I didn't lose in the final count. Uh, and the other main move after a3 is h6. And here bishop a2 is uh, less attractive because having covered the uh, g5 square, black can actually meet bishop a2 with knight, b, knight b8, and the uh, whoops, uh, the pawn on e4 is actually hanging here because there is never any shenanigans with knight g5. So white plays bishop c2, and now we can go knight b8, b4, knight b7, bishop b2, g6, and there is a tremendous body of theory connected with this position. The main move here is queen b1, once again, protecting the pawn on e4 so that the knight can uh, start towards the uh, b3, a5 squares. Or you can play c3, c4, which is also a cr crucial attempt, but I think here the theory says that this position eventually uh, is quite okay for black. There are other, other ways to play it for black as well, but e g4 and then c6 in this position is what you're supposed to be uh, doing, uh, or at least this was the case when I last looked at this line. And now we go back, all the way back to the position they got uh, on the board here. Uh, and here, after bishop c2, g6, you really are supposed to instantly play d4, d5. This is by far uh, uh, the main move. 
uh, if you play uh, b3, uh, hoping to get the position slightly later, it already uh, allows d6, d5 with immediate equality. So you play d5, knight b8, you play b3, c6, c4, knight bd7. And there is a great amount, uh, a decent amount of uh, high-level practice. Most of it somewhat outdated, though. People like uh, Geller uh, on the white side and uh, Lubojevic in particular and Bilavsky, for instance, on the black side, played a lot of this position, let's say, in the mid-80s. Mid and there's also some, some newer examples. Uh, a reasonably high-level play uh, game played from this position uh, in this millennium has been a game, let's say, between Mickey Adams and uh, Nidich. And generally, white goes a knight of one here. Uh, touching the pawn uh, on a2 is really inadvisable. You don't want to waste the tempo on something like a4, and also I think it might be counterproductive. And the general setup you aim for is this knight goes here, bishop gets developed to g5, when it gets chased it goes back to e3, this knight often goes here, and uh, another possible setup has been shown actually by Lubomir Lubojevic, he played bishop d2 here against Ryshevsky, takes, takes a5, knight 3 a2, suggesting that maybe one pair of knights can be traded, Ryshevsky played h5, and now Lubojevic uh, showed a very cute rook lift, rook a3, and then rook c3 and rook a3. And this rook actually does a very good job uh, keeping an eye on the pawn on a5. This rook goes to b1, uh, then you can either go knight, uh, knight e3, knight f3 back, or as Ryshevsky actually has done in that game, you can put the bishop here, knight here, and it is white actually who does most of the running on the queen side. So this would be, like I could, I could spend uh, a lot more uh, trying to cover the the intricacies of strategic plans here for both sides, but in general, play is heavily concentrated around the uh, the fight for the queen side, and it is somewhat tempo based. You need to be you need to be the first one to make some progress on the queen side here for sure. And Nidich, for instance, after knight f1 played knight c5, and instantly played knight g3, takes takes knight fd7, uh, and started doing something on the queen side in this fashion in that game against Miki. Instead of all that. Alireza already, I think, committed uh, 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 an inaccuracy by playing a3. And here it's very possible to play bishop g7. I'm not entirely sure what uh, Magnus didn't like about this. Uh, but I think he just wanted to get exactly the kind of position he got in the game. I think he wanted to uh, provoke uh, the structure that appeared. He played knight b8 instead. And... After knight b8, once again, having played a3, which is really a wasted tempo, it's a, it's a move that in most cases will not be useful. As you have seen, sometimes white even uses the a3 square for other pieces. The rook a3 idea is rook a3, e3 idea uh, that I have just shown you. It's rare, but it does exist. Uh, and mainly it's a move that you will not require in this position. After knight b8, I think... Going d4, d5, which is uh, what Alireza chose here, is a bit of a strange decision. You really, I mean, if you want to play d5, you should have done it on the previous move. And after knight b8 here, you probably should still play b4, knight bd7, bishop b2, bishop g7. But if you look at this position compared uh, to, uh, to the Zaitsev position, it's quite clear that black made a very useful move bishop g7 instead of a pretty useless move h7, h6. So... Uh, even if you do that, uh, it's quite obvious that Magnus would have won the opening duel. But it is, you know, it is white uh, doing these things. So there's obviously a great deal of safety, safety margins built in. And for instance, if you play c3, c4 here, I rather suspect white is not worse anyway. He, of course, isn't better because he isn't better with a pawn on h6 and a bishop on f8, but he should not be worse. Instead, I rather played d5. Uh, c6, c4, and here, and in particular on the next move, black has the option of taking on c4, but I think Magnus was extremely happy to just play a position with long pawn chains where you need to maneuver your pieces properly. And he already sort of envisaged exactly how this game will go. And on that note, um, there is uh, a new video series available on Chess24, published today, uh, for which this game would be a pretty good example, uh, and you should probably uh, check check that out. It's not often that you get uh, educational videos uh, recorded by the uh, reigning world champion. Uh, and after c4, knight bd7, 
here I think it was really required to switch back to a sort of normalcy and play b3, queen c7, and knight f1. And compared to the game, white at least in the position after, let's say, bc4, bc4, and rook e c8, white does get to play bishop d3, which is something that, as you will see in a moment in the game, he didn't have the option to do. And the computer, after something like this, already prefers black. But it's still possible uh, to get the bishop from a really horrible square on c2 to a slightly less horrible square on f1, where at least it supports your uh, your queen side a little bit and uh, doesn't get in the way. Instead, Alireza played a4, and here it actually is very sensible to uh, to go for this position with black. Queen c7, uh, bishop d2, uh, and here I was arguing for the immediate d6, d5, but this apparently is slightly hasty, but because um, some kind of a position like this is actually playable for white. But black can play rook a c8, rook c1, queen b8, and this, according to the machines, is actually quite a, quite a bit preferable for black. It's uh, White does not equalize here, at least not immediately. But uh, Magnus's decision I like uh, a great deal, because uh, I think... Uh, it's objectively stronger, most likely, but also uh, the resulting positions were just incredibly annoying for the young Iranian to play. He played queen c7, white finally played b3. Maybe you could already start looking at some kind of bailout possibilities here, like a b, a b, rook a8, let's say rook a8, we can take on c6, take on b5, play something like knight b1, which is a very typical idea in these types of positions. The knight really doesn't do very much on d2, and you want to put it on c3, where it supports the pawn on e4, works against the d6, d5 break. But clearly, uh, I mean, uh, white can never really be better in positions like this and uh, might uh, still be somewhat worse. But I think probably uh, this was a, a, a wise decision for, uh, for Ali Reza and he should have considered it more seriously. He played b3 and now after rook e c8 there is a very simple threat of cd5, cd5, queen takes c2. And you cannot really play bishop d3 because takes takes queen c3 just picks up material. So white continues to have to play really, really awkward moves. Rook a2 was Alireza's choice. B takes c4, b takes c4, a5. It's an important move because you want to stop a4, a5, and you also want to play bishop a6 and rook a, b8. This is your ideal squares for pieces. And this is probably, I mean, it will sound harsh, but... This is probably the last position where white could have gotten uh, could have gotten some important defensive maneuvers and, and could have uh, maybe uh, gotten a playable position. And Ayreza made the most natural move in the position, seemingly knight of one. This is what you do in the Spanish, right? Knight of one. But after that, I think with precise play, it is possible to make an argument that the game is sort of beyond salvation, in particular against Magnus on a good day. And what he should have done is play knight b1, bishop a6, and knight a3. Actually intending, if allowed, to take on c6, play something like knight of 3 d2, and knight a3, b5. Just absolutely plumbing everything on the queen side, saying, I, this is not pretty, in fact, I would describe it as ugly, but I want to make sure that no bad things happen to me on the queen side, at least immediately. And the computer says, actually, dc6, allowing dc6 is a mistake, you should take, take, rook b8, we play bishop e3, knight c5, knight d2, rook b4. It is still to be preferred for black, but for instance, here the machine says you can give up this pawn, play something like queen f3, put this rook on a1, and say, I actually now do have positional compensation, the bishop on e3 is quite nice, black will have to concentrate really, really hard not to give this pawn back, and... Obviously, this is nobody's dream of, of a white game playing like this. But I think you do survive this position occasionally. Whereas after knight f1, bishop a6, knight a3, knight a3, sorry. And here, uh, a minor inaccuracy, I think, by, uh, by Magnus. It was better uh, to start by taking. If white takes, queen, queen d8 just picks up the pawn on c4. Although it might be the best choice white has here already. Something like knight d2 here. And if white does take to the pawn, which he normally does by autopiloting, uh, black plays rook b8 and gets exactly what they got in the game. Instead, Magnus played knight c5, and here, once again, it was time to play dc6, put the knight on d5. Black probably drops the knight back, we play knight g2. And now we, we enter this phase of the game where basically white will continue offering the pawn on c4 
on every move and black will continue saying i don't want it just yet i want more this is not enough i don't want to sell my position short for instance here i think rook b8 is the best move not taking on c4 because if you do take on c4 white definitely gets a very decent uh, you know typical spanish compensation i think white is instantly nowhere near nowhere near worse uh, but after b8, the pieces are still uh, kind of misplaced. Uh, in the same variation, if black takes on c4 next move, bishop b3 will not be available, which is hu a huge deal, because this is exactly the diagonal you want this bishop to be on. And this is still... Let, let me uh, make it clear that I'm not arguing white is fine here. But it was, I think, by far the better choice. Instead, Alireza played knight d2, and now cd5, cd5, rook b8... And it is surprising just how horrible this position is, perhaps. But the more you look at it, the more you realize that uh, having placed his pieces on the squares, and in particular because this bishop, it really should be on e3. And then these knights have to be positioned somewhere around it. But with the bishop on c1 and the rest of his pieces bunched together, and the black pieces, I mean, these are already ideally positioned. Uh, yeah, arrows. Let's start again. These are great. And this one. The bishop will be on h6 quite soon. And it will also do a great uh, uh, do a great job putting additional pressure on the white position. And white basically has no home for any of his pieces. And also no way to, uh, to simplify. You cannot play knight b3. Because that loses material instantly to, let's say, queen takes c1, among other things. And rook takes b3 in the end. So you're basically reduced to shuffling back and forth and never really achieving any any uh, good outcomes. Alireza played bishop a3, queen d8. The immediate h5 was the computer's first choice, but Magnus played it next move, so it doesn't really matter a great deal. Uh, Alireza at least managed to trade uh, one rook, but his position doesn't really improve. And by this point, in a position where it is equal material and black doesn't even have a, an immediate threat, and will not have an immediate threat for it for, for a while for a while yet. Uh, a strong machine will tell you that this is uh, between minus 1.5 and minus 2. So two pawns down for white. Basically lost. And this is what uh, what ended up happening in the game. Another factor here by this point quite clearly was that Alireza very frustrated with uh, the fact that none of his pieces really uh, can go anywhere. Started running really short on time. So he goes knight f1, Magnus plays h4, knight goes back. And it's difficult to even criticize this. It looks like a waste of time, in particular when you go knight f1 back after bishop f4. But I tried clicking around, and the computer doesn't really suggest any improvements. Like, in this position, I think rook c1 may be intending to play bishop d1 is marginally better than uh, what Alireza has done. But the, the variation doesn't improve. It's still unbelievably bad for white. Uh, so knight f1, h4, knight e3, bishop f4, knight f1, queen c7. Slowly, slowly building up the, uh, the pressure. Um, the queen often actually aims for the a7 square. There's also often a very simple threat of playing knight c5, d7. And then white actually starts running out of squares. Because there's really not a good square the, to put this b b bishop on. And often, let's say, queen c3 will, will end the game. Alireza played g3. I'm sure he understood that by doing this, he breaks up his own position even further. But you have to start making moves at some point. Once again, uh, no blame, I think, is attached to, to Alireza here for this decision. h4. And here is, for instance, one such moment. Playing knight cd7 here uh, is, I think, just mathematically winning for black because uh, the bishop is hanging. Rook c1 is unthinkable because there is a spin. Rook b2 looks extremely ugly. So you can go bishop d3, and in this position you realize that you cannot actually protect uh, both these guys. So one of them gets dropped immediately, and the other one uh, will get picked up later on, basically. Your entire position starts to collapse. Uh, or you can play bishop d1, when after queen a7 check, the threat is queen d4. And if queen f2, black can just take here, take here, take here. And once again, the position just goes to pieces. Uh, losing the central pawn is just the start of white's problems here. Black just uh, uh, 
uh, comes rushing in and it feels like black has uh, like more pieces on the board uh, how ineffective the white pieces are here but queen d7 which is what magnus finally settled on is not a mistake king g2 knight takes a4 uh, bishop takes a4 you can try starting with bishop takes d6 which is a kind of a fanciful way of trying to offer this piece to black this also wins but I wanted to show you, uh, once again, an example of total dominance without having to calculate anything. Queen takes d6, bishop takes a4. And now we even give up our uh, proud two bishops, play rook c4, pick up the pawn on e4. And this is like the absolute dreamiest Nindorf you've ever seen. This is uh, so completely winning for black. Uh, instead, there is a played bishop takes a4. He was very, very short on time here. This is move 36, but... Uh, he was uh, down to bare minutes, queen takes, bishop takes d6, queen d4, of course allowing bishop takes d5 would be a mistake. And now queen f2, not the best move in the position, but frankly there are no good moves in this position. And here uh, many things win, and I think the most, uh, uh, the most uh, demonstrative one is to play queen c3, keeping the queens on the board for now. I guess the biggest threat uh, black has here uh, has to be maybe bishop d3, knight g4 is also a huge threat. There is, it's difficult to list all of them. White probably should play king h3, at least uh, stopping knight g4 for now. And in this position, probably why Magnus hasn't played this, is that in this position, the move that wins the hardest, I mean, the, I think the first five moves are minus three and above. But the move that the machine likes the most, somehow, is rook e8, which surprisingly reestablishes the threat of knight g4, because if white takes this knight, there will now be uh, bishop c8 mate in one move as reply. And also, kind of importantly, we protect the, knight, the, the pawn on e5, and we make sure that we no longer have to calculate any tactics connected with bishop takes e5. And it's just impossible to make a move here for white. I think probably if, if I were to describe the biggest problem white has, it is that it is a weird case of a more or less complete Zugzwang in a position with plenty of pieces on the board. It's just... Whatever you want to play here with white will instantly stop dro start dropping material. But basically, by this point, all of us, we were expecting that the game is about to finish in a second, and Magnus slightly took his eye off the ball. Move 38, he committed a, objectively, a rather large mistake by taking on f2 and taking on f1. And in this position, and I think, honestly, Magnus probably expected it to happen. Now, Alireza just resigned, because obviously, knight on d2 is hanging. Oh yeah, I can't do I can't do arrows. And if you take with the knight, you just lose the bishop on the six with check. Uh, so it felt, I think, uh, to Alireza like a very normal time to resign. You're a piece down against the world champion. Why would you continue playing? But as a matter of fact, this is arguably by far the best position he's had in the last ten moves. You should take on f1 with the king. Bishop takes d2, and now you uh, create this pin. And the immediate threat is rook b6. If black goes rook e8. After uh, bishop a1, uh, it's actually not that not that easy to uh, to make uh, any kind of sensible progress. After bishop b4, white has the additional idea of g4, g5, and after rook takes e4, d6, it's actually already completely equal according to the machine, pretty much. Uh, so the best move black has here, uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, because I really at first when when uh, chat started saying that this was something that should have been played against instead of resignation. And not only, uh, you know, too early to resign, continue fighting, but actually white has chances to uh, not to lose here. I assume that, yes, there's bishop c3, but there must be stronger moves. But actually, no, bishop c3 is the, uh, the only move that uh, actually uh, probably wins the game. But, but white has rook c1 in reply. You have to take on e5, white takes on c8. And here we get a position where... Uh, black quite clearly is much better, of course. Black can take this guy, can take this guy, and after that he will have two light pieces for the rook. He has an outside passer. So the expectation is black still wins, but it's not as clear-cut as all that. Uh, in particular, like there is, there is a position like this that black can pretty much always get, which I assume is eventually winning, uh, because the pawn on a5 will probably fall, as will the pawn on d5, the pawn f7 will survive, and uh, uh, knight, bishop, and the pawn should eventually beat the rook, I assume. Uh, I actually probably should have checked this with a table base, but I didn't. Uh, but the evaluation is not really very high, uh, and 
it's definitely something that you can test uh, because often the rook actually is a surprisingly large nuisance in positions like this. And because of that, probably the cleanest way to, con to continue after rook takes c8 is to take on g3. Uh, this is hanging, this is hanging. If you give up on e4 here, uh, white will not really get rid of the, bl uh, the black king side. So you have to play rook c4, protecting this, boy, uh, th this pawn, also stopping a4, also stopping bishop takes h4, e5, of course. And after rook c4, the computer says go, go king f8, go king e7, then bishop d6, then knight d7, and eventually you will win. But obviously, had uh, Ali Reza known that uh, by uh, playing king takes f1 here, he gets this endgame, he would have continued, because uh, generally, uh, every now and again, these types of positions get saved uh, by the player with the rook, because uh, black commit starts committing some inaccuracies, and uh, there's some counterplay, or too many pawns get removed from the board, and occasionally you don't win. So it was a case of perhaps uh, resigning a little bit too early, but also it's very difficult to blame Ali Reza because he has been completely lost for a while in this game. And this uh, concludes the first encounter of uh, uh, the 16-year-old uh, uh, Iranian uh, prodigy Ali Reza Firuja, who loses his first ever game against uh, the reigning world champion. I think uh, Magnus will be very pleased with that result because I think everybody, Magnus included, expects uh, these two to play uh, a great number of games uh, in the future. Uh, there has been a lot of, uh, apart from, uh, oh my god, Ali Reza, we want more Ali Reza, there has been uh, some cries I've seen uh, in various chats that we keep an eye on during the live show, some cries of, uh, overhyped, uh, wake me up when he actually wins something, uh, which is sort of a, you know a sort of grumpiness, which I, I generally, as a as a grumpy old man by this point, I kind of endorse. But I think it's very very difficult not to get overhyped about uh, about Firuja because he is, uh, uh, I think, quite clearly the most uh, rounded. Uh, prodigy to to appear on the scene compared to somebody like uh, Wei Yi, who who at that, at that age would absolutely destroy people if he was given the chance to give a mating attack. But if you decided to play a boring uh, boring endgame against him, would uh, actually quite visibly not like it very much. I think Ali Reza is uh, by sixteen a much more much more well-rounded player and. It is very, very uh, uh, difficult not to be excited uh, when watching him play. So I think for Magnus, it's a very nice way to sort of set the tone uh, for their classical encounters. Although he will be uh, somewhat miffed at, uh, at not winning cleanly from here. Uh, with this slight blemish, it is still a positional masterpiece, but uh, knowing uh, how much of a perfectionist he is, he will be... Uh, somewhat upset that he uh, did not finish uh, the game off in style. All in all, uh, it remains uh, an important victory for him, and also in the context of of the tournament, of course, and uh, uh, in the standings uh, after round nine, uh, Fabiano Carano is now leading uh, in clear first place on plus three, and Magnus now joins a tie for second. Uh, with Firuja himself after that loss, and also on plus two are Wesley So and Jordan Van Forest, who came very close actually to winning his game against uh, Vladislav Kovalev and joining uh, the tie for first. Uh, Firuja plays Karana with the black pieces tomorrow, which is also a very exciting game we shall be, we shall be keeping an eye on. But uh, for now, I'm signing off. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video. This has been Peter Svidler for Chess24.